cryosphere. We've got two more spheres. We've got cryosphere and atmosphere in this session. To kick us off with cryosphere, we've got David Gwyther from University of Queensland. Take it away, David. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm a... Oh, I want to kind of give you some ideas of what the big questions are, the, I guess the, the known unknowns in the cryosphere, some of the ways that the cryosphere couples with the other spheres, and hopefully in this process we'll kind of identify some opportunities for uh, better kind of integration between these spheres. I'm at the University of Queensland. I'm, a, I'm actually a numerical ocean modeler or, and physical oceanographer by trade, but um, uh, my kind of um, career has been uh, looking at interactions between the Southern Ocean and Antarctica's fringing uh, ice shelves. So I kind of sit uniquely or maybe awkwardly, depending on your perspective, um, coupled kind of between these spheres. And this talk really is representing and, and with input from the Australian cryospheric community, which is, as Chen mentioned, small, but it's growing. So. Um, just so some of you don't need to go to Google, like um, Professor Possingham, um, to look at what the cryosphere is, I'll give you a quick overview. It's basically the frozen water part of the Earth system and encompasses all of those processes, interactions uh, that we see happening in the poles, the North Pole, the Arctic, Greenland, and the South Pole, Antarctica, and also the mountain glacier regions, um, uh, including uh, the, the very small ice cap in um, Iceland. But really, because there's so much focus from the Australian research community of, on Antarctica, that's where I'm going to talk about, um, focus my talk today. Uh, if, you, if you're not aware, and given the kind of Australian focus we've heard mostly so far, um, Antarctica is uh, an ice sheet, so four or five kilometre thick um, plate of ice sitting on bedrock, slowly flowing off that rock into the ocean where it forms kind of kilometre thick ice shelves, fringing ice shelves that interact with the ocean below. They in turn form, form icebergs and around Antarctica you get sea ice which uh, freezes and melts each year. Together these, these um, components form the cryosphere, particularly the Antarctic cryosphere. So that's the, uh, the overview. I want to first, by, so first look at what some of the big kind of emerging questions are. And these questions all kind of need this um, cross-sphere thinking. And the first one I want to talk about is tipping points. Now you've probably, as we've, we've seen this a few times today, plots like this, a time series graph. This one here is showing um, mean sea level projections over the next 300 years across two different emission scenarios. You'll see that there's error bars, uh, but essentially these are just smooth lines. And that's completely neglecting what is actually going to happen with contributions to sea level rise from Antarctica. It's not going to be a smooth process the whole time. Antarctica is susceptible to rapid changes, to tipping points, to irreversible or non-reversible um, uh, stochastic change. One of these that I've just shown this image of here is a collapse of an ice shelf. This is a, a smallish ice shelf that collapsed um, in the early 2000s. Over the course of three months, the entire ice shelf collapsed and glaciers accelerated as a response to that, adding more sea level rise into the ocean. And we know that there's big catchments of ice, you know, orders of meters of sea level rise equivalent um, that can, that can, is likely going to be affected by instabilities like this. And our models have no way to capture these, or do not capture these uh, processes. Uh, and then if you look at the projections in the future, the, model, the models that are being used for projections, they certainly don't capture anything like this. So that's one big uh, problem, really, one big question. The next, um, I think Elizabeth mentioned this, uh, changes the sea ice extent. Uh, this year we saw record low um, sea ice extent around Antarctica, beating the previous record of 2022. And it's something like six to seven standard deviations below the mean. We don't really know what's causing this. It could be um, changes uh, from the atmosphere. It could be that the ocean surface layers are warmer. It could even be that there's changes in input from the cryosphere itself. In any case, all of this is probably pointing towards a regime change with that magnitude of um, change this year. 
the next is um, a pro, uh, an idea which is related to what a lot of my work has been on, which is trying to capture, better capture these boundary layer processes. You know, cri the cryosphere, Antarctica, is, is very tightly coupled to the other spheres through the atmosphere, through what's happening at the solid earth interaction and in the ocean. And if I just point out one thing that we see in the ocean, uh, we're trying to understand what's happening at that boundary layer between the ocean and the ice and how it's doing that melting. To do this, we have to, we really need to kind of uh, devise these simple models, these parameterizations. To do this, for example, in a hydraulic model, we might assume that it's got some kind of n nearly smooth surface with slight roughness. But in reality, you get this huge change in spatial scales of roughness, six centimetres up to three metre scale morphology. You get ice crystals that accrete on and then pulled off and actually the entire um, kind of crystal raft can move along. How do you capture these different scales of complexity um, and in, in time as well? It's a big unknown question. And then how do you put all this into a model that you're going to use for making future projections? The next is a next um, question is a kind of um, uh, emerging issue, which has been identified, and Chen mentioned this as well. This is this idea of subglacial drainage. Antarctica is sitting on rock; it's got volcanoes below it. There's geothermal heat. It's also very slowly, slowly sliding, and just enough there's enough, enough friction to melt and form liquid water below um, Antarctica. This forms entire hydrology system beneath Antarctica. There's lakes, channels, rivers, even swamp-like areas. All that water flows out beneath the ice into the ocean beneath these ice shelves. This is a kind of simulation of what that might, these channels might look like. We can see the, the surface imprint from satellite observations of what that is doing underneath. But it's only uh, recently that we've actually tried to understand what it's doing to the ocean and to the cryosphere. This simulation shows that plume of subglacial drainage exiting out from beneath the ice sheet, and we see that it increases melting, and it's actually likely impacts sea ice formation as well. So this is a, a very tightly coupled process between the cryosphere and the hydrosphere and the solid earth. So I said the word coupling, and we know that the cryosphere is tightly coupled um, to all the other spheres, actually, and I, I just want to kind of now step through some of the kind of key couplings that, I, that I've identified or we've identified, but there's certainly other ones as well. Firstly, the link with the atmosphere. We know that Antarctica is very, um, influ very strongly influenced by the atmosphere. For example, changes in the climate modes and cli climate change. This red line over time is, the change in the red line over time is the like a kind of Enzo plus the Amundsen Sea low pressure system. So it's just a climate mode. And it, it pretty well correlates with thinning of ice shelves around Antarctica. So this is illustrating that the atmosphere is influencing the ocean, which is influencing the cryosphere. In turn, that influences sea level rise, which influences the biosphere, I guess. Um, that's one um, link. And the other part of this is that uh, these um, atmospheric models that we use in the in kind of cryospheric sciences, they're actually suggesting that precipitation is going to increase under climate change due to a wetter atmosphere. But the models themselves, they're not great. Um, and there needs to be a lot more kind of um, development of the atmospheric models around Antarctica in order to, to make better projections. I've already touched on the links with the hydrosphere, uh, this kind of ice ocean interaction and melting. But I'll just also mention that the cryosphere is critical for bottom water formation. And this is what, um, and someone has actually mentioned this, this global overturning circulation. Antarctica forms the kind of return leg of that. And there's, there's a, a paper came out recently suggesting that there's a potential uh, regime change in the global um, meridional overturning circulation, which is kind of like an, an earth system scale impact if it was to happen. Links with the geosphere, uh, there, there's glacial isostatic adjustment, which is the rebounding of Earth crust to paleo glacial loading. That's one aspect. But the other one I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail is what you see in this picture here. This is from a, um, a study where they imagined, or well, they modelled the collapse of the entire West Antarctic ice sheet, something like three metres of global mean sea level rise into the ocean. It's actually not 
that outlandish a prospect now. And if you do that, you'd imagine maybe that just distributes equally over the ocean. In reality, it doesn't. When you remove that ice off Antarctica, Earth's spin changes, the gravitational um, potential of the Earth changes because you've moved that mass away from the bottom of the Earth. And then as a result, that water will move to different parts to kind of equilibrate that gravitational potential. So you actually see peaks in sea level rise at different locations. So this is sea level fingerprinting, and it's, a, it's, it's another way where um, the cryosphere, which might seem quite um, distant to uh, Australia, for example, isn't. It's actually making, a, it has a sea level fingerprint on our, re, our, re, our coastlines. The Antarctica used to be thought of as a kind of, or much of it as a barren desert. In fact, it's not if you know where to look. It's a, it's a teeming, it's like the environment's teeming with life. This is a, a video taken down a borehole, a 40 centimetre wide borehole drilled down 600 metres into the ice, into the ocean in a, an ocean cavity. And keep in mind, this is over 500 kilometres from any, um, any open ocean. And this is what they film when they turn on their cameras. It's a, it's a thriving community of these little amphipods, some kind of like krill-like critters a few centimetres long. Uh, and the reason they think that they're there, so far from any, so far from sunlight, so far from where we thought we'd find life, is that this is the, an outlet of subglacial drainage. And the idea is that this freshwater is carrying enough iron to promote some kind of ecosystem development there. So I just want to um, just cover some broader considerations, and some of these have been talked about in our, um, in our panel sessions. The first one is this idea of better integration through better model observation or data synthesis. Uh, traditionally, modelers, and I'm a modeler, so I can say this, we just use observations to validate our model. And observationalists won't even use a model. They don't want a model, right? That's the way I've seen it happening in the past, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. It shouldn't be like that. If you look at what's done in the atmospheric and um, in the oceanic communities, we have data assimilating models. For example, I've got some plots here showing a vertical transect of temperature in the ocean, and then the four columns after that are showing error in a data assimilating simulation of that temperature. And you can see one of them has a much lower error with a more kind of less, or less red colors. This is just illustrating that we should be using these observations we take directly and use the error associated with those observations to improve our models, right? It's being done in the atmospheric and oceanic and ocean modeling communities, but it's virtually unheard of in cryospheric science. Um, and then this idea of, um, I wanted to kind of touch on this idea of uh, variability across scales. And, and I'm talking about in time and space here. And I've already talked about the variability across space, actually, when I showed you the different scales of roughness you get and how we're meant to, how on Earth we're meant to parameterize this in a, in a model. But we also see this variability in, in time. And I've got a plot here, a time series plot, and the orange line is the melting underneath an ice shelf where you add in all the climate drivers, climate modes, climate change, uh, seasonal cycle, everything, and it's forcing that model to to look at what, how melting is changing. The blue line is where you just include purely the ocean variability. There's no climate forcing at all. What you see is that the, the signal, let's say, the climate change signal, is barely discernible above the noise. So if, if we're trying to detect an attribute change, we need to be observing, in, in some systems, observing long enough that that signal is emerging above the noise floor. And then, of course, the problem with the cryosphere is how do you do that when you've got processes like iceberg carving? These are sporadic um, but rapid events which might um, have a large impact on the cryosphere and, and the hydrosphere and the biosphere. But um, for the cryosphere, it's, it's essentially just continuum models. How do you simulate um, discrete changes in that system? Um, I would be very interested to see what can be learnt from how this is done in the other spheres, particularly, I guess, the biosphere, where um, complexity across scales is a, is a kind of something that you've looked at previously. And I wanted to finish with this slide, which is just a bit of historical perspective. The first atmosphere model, 
uh, produced just after the war in the early 1950s. The first ocean model was in the mid 60s. The first Antarctic or numerical model of Antarctica was produced in the early 80s. So there's about a 15 to 20 year uh, offset in development um, in the different spheres, in these different spheres. And actually, while these models have improved significantly, that offset, that hierarchy still exists today. So the point is, we need dedicated funded model development. We need money and time put into developing better parameterizations and particularly understanding how to couple across the different spheres. And I've included these three spheres, but I also mean the other two spheres as well, maybe the cultural sphere too, actually. And with that, I will just finish and leave just some final thoughts up. Thank you. Well done, David. Really liked the way you did that. That was really good. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have ooh, two of my colleagues from Geoscience Australia, early career presenters. We've got Jonathan and Kimberly. I'm not sure who's going first or who's who's going sec. Who's on first? Who's on second or whatever? But um, yeah. Okay. Terrific. So. Um, Let's hear about the um, cryosphere priorities from an ECR perspective. Take it away. Hi, everyone. My name's Kimberly. I'm from Geoscience Australia. I'll apologise. Jonathan is not joining me up here. But um, Hannes is, and he's from NCI. And recently, a doctor in uh, the cryosphere. So congratulations, Hannes. <laughs> Uh, I'll let him introduce my, himself, but um, me, I uh, have, I'm an honor, honorary cryosphere scientist at the moment, um, and I'm just talking from my perspective. For the past uh, six months or so, I've been working on scoping a digital Earth Antarctica project with uh, Geoscience Australia, and within this work, I've been talking a lot with um, our stakeholders down at the Australian Antarctic Division and also at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, which is where I'm completing my PhD as well. So I'll let Hannes uh, kick us off and introduce himself. Uh, and just also a shout out to Lawrence Bird, who also gave us his perspectives. He's a PhD candidate at Monash University, um, studying ice sheet flow and modeling ice sheet flow in Antarctica. Thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, I'm Hannes Holman. I work for NCI in the data collections team, so I'm data manager is my role. Uh, but I have a PhD in glaciology and geophysics. So my career so far has given me insight into glaciology, geophysics, and data in a very broad sense. So these are kind of the things that I will focus on here. Uh, many of the points that I'll raise uh, are kind of general about how to maximize data or the usage of data, how to maybe acquire more data, uh, but they are that more important in the Antarctic context, I think, uh, or cryospheric context, because um, any data point that we collect on Antarctica or Greenland is basically a one-off on most of them, because Antarctica is incredibly hard to access, it's very remote, any, any research you do down there is very expensive, so um, it's really important that any data point counts and that when a c survey is actually performed, when there is the funding available for it, that the data, that, that we maximize the amount of data that we get out of it. Um, yeah, with that, I'll just go to my first slide. Um, and yeah, the, the, the first thing basically I just wanted to mention that context is um, that when a survey is uh, funded, uh, I think it's, uh, there, there should be um, uh, an incentive to basically not just collect data for the sphere that funds the project, because usually an, uh, we, 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 we fund, like a survey is funded by, with a certain purpose in mind, of course, which is usually in the end a high impact research paper, for example. But uh, when we are on the ice, it is quite easy to not just collect data for the sphere that, or for the field that we are working on, but also use the opportunity to collect data for other fields of research, um, especially that, in Antarctica, there's always something that goes wrong. You, can't, you can never just go where you would like to go because the weather never plays into your hand. Uh, so using that time, for example, to collect data that is also important and maybe coordinated with scientists from other spheres, in my case, for example, with 
um, which was collecting data about snow and ice, uh, maybe coordinated with um, atmospheric researchers so that you collect data for them as well while you're down there. I think that is very important to maximize the amount of data and high impact data that you can um, that you can collect. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, the, the the second point is just uh, we really need to make sure that we um, support data delivery end to end. What I mean by that is the data a research uh, data life cycle. Um, oftentimes there's the planning stage, and the planning stage often kind of goes until the publication stage, um, and not so much further than that. Um, and I think in this context, basically I want to raise two points. The, third, the first is just um, we need to make sure that all stages of this life cycle are recognized properly um, because it's especially in Antarctica and in uh, Greenland, in the planning and logistics, uh, usually they, they take you months, if not a year or so, of, like, of the time of an ECR or of a postdoc. Um, so recognizing that properly, I think, is very important um, because it gives the people that plan the survey, if you don't, if you aren't stuck with just, you have to publish this one paper out of your, se of, out of your field season, um, it gives you a high incentive to just collect data that is high impact. So you can basically cover your boxes, but uh, tick your boxes, but then maybe collect data that is overall of more impact because of you will still get recognition for it, or it, it makes it easier to get recognition for data you collect. Um, yeah, and then um, the other is just we need to make sure that in the planning stage we also include preservation and reuse because, as I said, every data point that you collect in Antarctica and Antarctica and Greenland is unique, very unique. So you really don't want to lose that data. But um, we are in the process of losing a lot of data that currently sits on hard drives or other sources and is not actually really incorporated properly and the metadata gets lost and then you can't use the data anymore. That is just that much more important, especially now with AI, AI and ML coming around. We just don't know what this data could be used for. Um, that slide was supposed to look a bit different, but that doesn't really matter that much. Um, my last point was just about data discoverability. Um, and one thing I noticed during my PhD was that um, Getting access to data was usually, it was basically either I contacted a person that I know and asked that person if that person knows a person who has data, or it was me um, basically reading papers and contacting the people I read about. But it was really rarely that I actually uh, tried to get data through one of the portals because a lot of the data is actually not on that portal, on those portals, and if it is, it usually just says contact the scientists. So, yeah, that is really suboptimal and should really be Im improved, not just for, um, yeah, for all kinds of spheres, really, that I work in Antarctica. Uh, but for me, in geophysics and seismics, I, that was really a big, big, big issue um, that you never know where the data actually is. And if you find it, it's in all kinds of formats and not standardized. I think that is a big issue that really slows down research down south. Um, well, I think that was all I wanted to mention. Thank you for your time. Um, so I'm just going to finish off, finish off um, highlighting um, three other priorities. Um, so firstly, uh, you know, Antarctic uh, research and maybe less so the Arctic, but also the Arctic, anywhere in a harsh terrain environment, even over, say, the glaciers in New Zealand um, or other in the Alps, um, it, it takes a lot to get there. And um, inherently, um, cryospheric research is an international effort, um, particularly in Antarctica and the Arctic, where no, no one kind of owns the land in Antarctica. Um, and in order to get a uh, continental scale and circumpolar view, we have to collaborate internationally. And through data synthesis and data aggregation efforts, um, all come together and um, work towards um, similar goals. And there are, are two large bodies that help us to do this, um, SCAR, the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, and SUS, the Southern Ocean Observing System. And these um, international mechanisms um, have proven very valuable for scientists as they help us um, really distill what our priorities are um, for at, Antarctic research and help um, maximise the efforts which cost so much um, to go down there and collect data and work to do that. 
Um, and in reference to collaborations across spheres, there really is untapped potential. Cryospheric scientists are scavengers by nature. We <laughs> they try and get uh, their hands on any data that they can because they're simply it's a sparse data problem. Um, and there are potentials where looking rather than just to the ice, but back to say the hydrosphere, for example. Um, Lawrence gave a good example, uh, which kind of tracks on uh, what David was talking about before. There's opportunities um, where we can use um, modelling perspectives from the other spheres to help calibrate and validate ice sheet flow models, for example. And another um, couple of points I wanted to make on this is that um, Antarctica specifically is so important for us as Australians to understand because Antarctic weather actually drives our weather. And um, it's, if you ever go down to Tasmania, um, you know that in Hobart, the predictability of um, the weather forecast by the Bureau of Meteorology is actually very hit and miss. And a large reason for this is because sea ice isn't captured in the models. And our understanding of um, the cryosphere from Antarctica um, is just not there for us to be able to reliably predict what's happening in Australia. And this, this goes for droughts as well. Um, there's been some really good uh, research coming out um, showing that there's a, a strong link between Antarctic snowfall and circumpolar circulation in the atmosphere and Australian drought conditions in Eastern Australia. Um, secondly, kind of building on this point that it takes a lot for us to get there, that really amplifies the value of Earth observation technologies and, and satellites in Antarctica. Relying on uh, remote sensing technology is um, something that Antarctic and cryospheric researchers are kind of bound to. Um, but unfortunately, the quality of these observations aren't really holding up to the standards of the international Earth observation community. So someone needs to come forward and lead the way um, to invest in um, the synthesis and uplifting of these observations because um, through the stakeholder engagement um, that I've been doing in my work, it really is impeding progress in cryospheric research. Um, and Digital Earth Australia, um, again, cross-sphere, the learnings there really can um, help uplift what is possible in Antarctica because so many of the studies and the, the algorithms developed either at a local scale or if they have managed to be done at a continental scale are one-hit wonders they're lost in the literature because there's no infrastructure there to operationalise and um, upscale this research so that it's robust and can be used for um, large-scale um, insights. And a good example of this is climate models do not capture sea ice at a daily or a, a spatial resolution that is sufficient enough um, to you know, capture the impacts of sea ice in these models. They use um, monthly averages um, from, from course um, resolution observations. And finally, just as a testament to uh, why I'm talking, we need more ECRs in the cryosphere. Um, really struggled to find an uh, uh, existing uh, PhD student to come and, and talk today and um, have that opportunity. And, uh, yeah, just including um, the cryosphere as much as we can is obviously really important and also supporting um, cryospheric research in Australia. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Rebecca, the microphone's on the end there. Um, panel, come on. <laughs> come on down. No, come on. You're going to hide, are you, Donald? Okay, that's, that's fine. Now. Thanks. Thanks, Chen.
Thank you for the evidence, and they provide a very good overview about the um, the key science question driven in the Cryosphere, and also the last slide from Dave also give a quite a summary about uh, how urgent it is for the Cryosphere to be uh, integrated with other spheres here. And um, um, I, I think has uh, raised a very good point about data sh um, accessibility and. Uh, the openness of the data is also another challenge here. How how we can like share data from different uh, spheres, and it is another challenge to integrate data sets from different spheres. There's another issues and challenges related with this is that the the inconsistencies between these data sets. Like we have different data sets from observations and uh, different uh, measurements, and the way we process the data set, these kind of things will bring the challenges in the inconsistency in the data set, how we can uh, deal with this challenge. It also can uh, provide us like um, a thought about how we can provide a better data set for the uh, scientists from different spheres to make use of that data set. That's a uh, kind of thing from uh, that uh, talk. And um, uh, another thing that we, I, when I look at the shared Google Doc uh, by um, uh, seeking for the, uh, the, the points from the uh, audience here, I realized that we were missing the Quasphere structure in the Google Doc. And luckily, in the XSNI, we are kind of building our Quasphere community under the XSNI. And that's a very good starting point for, for our Quasphere community to grow up. And uh, I think that's a good pathway to, to encourage more ECRs join our Quasphere uh, community. Terrific. Thank you, Chen. So, Quasphere. <laughs> Where are we at, audience? We've got one and then to, then to Beryl, so. Hi, I'm Alex Torrords from the Australian Antarctic Division, and uh, yeah, thanks for those presentations. I'm not a cryosphere scientist, I'm a ecologist by training, but I am heading up an initiative called the Integrated Digital East Antarctic Initiative. And, and our, our real aspiration, I suppose, is to bring together and to improve the delivery of multidisciplinary data to improve the interoperability of those data. And I think it's been great to hear, from my point of view, there's two ends to it. There's the parameterization, which I think an initiative like IDEA can help with, the provision of data to help parameterize models. But I think what Hannes was talking about really resonated about the data accessibility. And from my point of view, the accessibility to the model outputs is probably as important, if not more important. And I think that's something that we're really focused on in our initiative, because those model outputs aren't as easily accessible to scientists in other spheres. And so as an ecologist, I've actually really struggled to try and access those easily. And I think if we can start to provide mechanisms like we're trying to do in our initiative, that'll, that'll help. And so um, I guess it's more of a comment than a question in some ways, but we are really driving towards this interdisciplinarity um, in the cryospheric sort of related research. Thanks. Oh, that's great. Does the, yeah, Chen, did you want to reply to that as Rebecca makes her way to Bill? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Like for the uh, model outputs, we really like uh, publish our model outputs based on the publications, share the data sets through the GitHub and the other, uh, also other platforms. But it brings another uh, issue raised by uh, Dave's talk also about the assimilation how to combine the measurements and the model outputs. That's kind of like a challenge in our Cryosphere as well. And uh, we have the outputs from models and sitting there, and we have like a limited observation there, but how to integrate those two big bodies here is kind of a challenge in our Cryosphere, yeah. Thanks, Chen. Uh, Beryl. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to remember what I was going to say. Um, it seems to... I mean, that was really great hearing about the cryosphere and and the interconnectedness of all of the other things that are... the challenges that are facing us. And I think the cryosphere has the opportunity to sort of be like the, the astronomy-type people. Everyone loves astronomy because it's all out there and it's all exciting and they don't know about it. Well, not many people know about the cryosphere... And I think that if there's a sufficient community of practice in your cryosphere thing, 
I would encourage you to put together a whole lot of facts about what's reliant on knowledge about the cryosphere. Like the drought com comment was really great. You know, I would plaster that everywhere on our uh, TURN website to show the interconnectedness. And I think we could get a whole lot of public excitement about the cryosphere and and there'd be a lot of people wanting to become early career researchers in it if they got all excited because, because it's the unknown domain on which a lot of things are relying and it's all happening very quickly. So I think it's an, an exciting place to be and I would encourage lots of uh, cross-sector communication if there's sufficient grouping to help drive it. And send her up to Andy there. That's, yeah, great comment, so Beryl. And, and, you know, I guess, you know, supportive, but recognising that opportunity. Jonathan Farrell. Uh, I, I guess uh, maybe touching on what David talked about with data assimilation, I just want to be a little bit clear about what a model is. Because I think, uh, depending on which sphere you're in, you might mean a different thing when you say a model. So Donald will probably think of a model as something that is data-driven. That is, you get a whole lot of data, you push it through some machine learning algorithm or uh, regression or something like that, and out of that you get some knowledge or, or, or an answer. Uh, whereas in, for example, the atmosphere or the ocean community, we have the advantage that we actually know exactly, almost exactly know the physical laws that govern the ocean and atmosphere system, and we can write models to solve those, those laws very well, except that the resolution, because of the turbulence and chaos in the system, the resolution we need to solve them exactly just isn't possible. So we, we, we need to take shortcuts, and, and that's where the model biases creep in. Um, and... and Dave made the point about um, data assimilation and data assimilation is sort of halfway between those two because it uses uh, physical models, models based on physical laws uh, and assimilates data to effectively use the model to interpolate between data points. So these are all different forms of modelling and often we, we sort of just say, uh, I'm going to use a model and uh, um, I, d I don't think that's a very good descriptor of what we actually do. In the cryosphere, it's even harder because in the cryosphere, it's also part way between. We, we sort of know that ice is roughly solid, but Chen's ice actually flows, and we don't quite know the equation of state for how that works, yet it's probably one of the most important things uh, that we're facing in, in, as humanity to, to solve how those ice sheets are going to behave under climate change. So that's another challenge again. Really good overview there, Andy. Any comments from the panel around that? Yeah, Donald. Uh, thanks. Um, so my comment was actually um, going back to one of the other, I mean, other, other topics uh, around the accessibility of data. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm interested in how much researchers in each of the spheres can articulate what are the primary uh, constraints in their communities on making data accessible. Uh, because it's not always the same thing. Some, you know, in some cases, it's intellectual property, it's publications. In other cases, it's too much effort and not enough tools that make it easy. Uh, not seeing the value because there's too little data being made available and reusable. Uh, but depending on which of those or other cri uh, factors are leading to it, there are different kinds of responses and levers that may be possible in each community. Uh, and I think understanding, understanding that uh, may help us to get further towards having more fair and reusable data. Fair, fair reply, Andy, nodding, no. No, smiling, not sure, Andy, or? Oh, it wasn't really, no. <laughs> okay. 
Just trying to drum something up. <laughs> Not seeing many hands. <laughs> yeah, trying to cause trouble. Is that a hand, Ben? <laughs> uh, Rebecca. Actually, while you're going there, I'm going to ask a question then. And that is, it's interesting we talk about the cryosphere and we automatically think about Antarctica. Because of our, I guess, parochialism towards the south. Um, but of course, this is about integrated Earth. And of course, the cryosphere is much bigger than than all of that in spa in spatially. But it's also over time, and we think about the cryosphere as something that has operated across the planet in deeper geological time. You know, we've had a record of um, continental ice on the Australian continent as well. And I guess, I don't know, I just want to raise that I think that's also, you know, when we talk about the cryosphere and either the Earth and then even the continent of Australia, um, that it also has a part to play there. And I, so, yeah, just wanted to raise that. Thanks to put a temporal perspective on it. Last week I said I probably will end up as a paleo CI scientist by the end of my scientific career um, because the way it's going at the moment, it's not very enticing. Um, I put my hand up to say um, difficulties to, to make data available is the sheer volume of data. So um, on one hand, it's the satellite, but also the model output and some of the instrumentation, radar and so on that we deploy, the volume of data. Every data center makes us sign up, you know, as part of a pro project funding. You have to submit the data and then we say, okay, this is the amount we need to lodge. And they say, the metadata is fine. Search somewhere else to store your data. But then there's also other data that's um, in, in our area, uh, but also in the oceans and probably in the ecosystems the same. It's the sparsity. It's like intermittent data at different locations. And it's just really hard to reconcile. So if you don't have continued uh, funding and sustained observation support, you're really struggling to, to build a valuable data set that then can be picked up in the different initiatives. And so I think we need to come together and share our experiences and work on a model forward. Um, and as we heard, you know, the future is ours, so AI and other uh, methods will be able to, uh, to harvest that. And so at the moment, we really need to work together and secure that the data will be there for, for the future to come for others to work off it. Yeah, good comment. It's actually a bit, a bit in there, a few different themes or threads, as Tim would call them, in that, that comment. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that's a problem that we also have in the geosphere, and I would say that we have that problem across all the spheres, um, that because we have such a large amount of data, as you were mentioning before, um, do you, unless you have a platform where it can be stored for a long time, um, and that is big enough, you know, we are talking about terabytes, of data, like you know, hundreds of terabytes. We are not going to fix the issue. And then the problem is that then the community won't be able to grow or like capitalize on that data if we don't have that platform. Um, I know that the community is also sharing codes on GitHub, and that's good, but the issue is that the model outputs are way too big, too big to be put on GitHub. So yet again, we need that platform to be able to um, to have the model outputs or big data sets. Yeah. And of course, to analyze them. <laughs> yes. We've got a couple from the panel here. Maybe if you've got the mic there, Helen, you go first, and then we'll go to Dan. On. Um, when you're talking about terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data, I think one one thing that occurs to me is the, the different sources of data that we have. We're talking about not only across the spheres, but the different people within those spheres working away, collecting data. So speaking from the geosphere um, perspective, we'll have academic data, you know, researchers like people in this room collecting information data building models, you know, uh, interpretations, that sort of thing. Then we have um, government geoscience agencies, such as Geoscience Australia or the, or the um, CSIRO or um, the state geological surveys, various people like that. There's another huge volumes of data, particularly from Geoscience Australia, covering the whole Australian continent um, and beyond, continental shelf as well. 
but then we also have industry, um, so sort of companies collecting huge amounts of geological data as well. So it's it's something where we have worked as a community quite hard to make as much of that data available as possible, but it requires government support and government platforms to do that. So Geoscience Australia have have a portal. I can't remember what it's called. Steve, what's it called? Uh, the Exploring for the Future portal, specifically. That one, or isn't, isn't there another one? Anyway, um, and then each of the state surveys has a portal as well where any company or government data is, is available freely to download. The one that I feel that slips through the gaps is academic data, research data, where um, because of the imperative to publish and the IP around that data, it's, it's so tightly held, whereas government data, it's government companies that have a legal requirement to submit data. So I feel like that's, that's something that perhaps could be discussed um, within this community here in the room, pro probably tomorrow or now, um, how, how we make, how academic researchers make their data freely available. Good comment. Oh, we've got one hand there and one hand there, and I know Dan's also keen to say something. But really interesting too, because you've covered there, Helen, both a carrot and a stick in how that data is made accessible, in that the carrot being that pre-competitive geoscience data, for instance, is funded to be made publicly available. Then you also talked a bit about the industry data, which is there is legislation that that needs to be made available once the company is done with it. So that's the stick and you know that's that's also an interesting thread through that. Yeah. yeah. So the this question of what how do we get research data online? How do we make it available? This question has been around for a long time and the OECD mandated um, open access to publicly funded research outputs, including data in two thousand and four. Um, and why haven't we made more progress? And now, well, one of the big carrots, I think, was the, the journal's demand that the evidence has to be supplied. But what we find often is that researchers aren't well supported in this. So then we point to the university libraries as the custodians of knowledge in, in the uni universities, and, and they struggle. So there's, there's a gap there that um, in OSCOP, we've identified as something where, yes, there are data platforms, but they're not, we can't integrate them because they're bibliographically oriented. They're not really supporting the fair data guidance principles. So OSCOP is now building a repository for research data to make that available. So there, there's a couple of pieces that need to come together to make this possible. So my prediction will be that even once we have all of this, it will still be ha too hard for many people <laughs> to do this. So we will have to think of other ways to make it both easy, but also have enough persuasion for people to comply with that mandate. Interesting comment. I know we had a hand over here, sorry. Yep, and we've also got one at the front. And I think, Leslie, was that a hand from you as well on this topic? Yeah, that's, I think that might be a hand. I, I was going to make some very similar points to that, but in some communities, and the weather and climate community is probably one of them, our data are published with our papers or you don't publish your papers. And most of those data are discoverable. In fact, it's now a fairly common practice to publish the analysis environment along with the data. Um, we're fortunate in NCI providing um, the environment for high-performance compute with the high-performance data environments. So for the, the communities who are at the petascale, which we are, um, having a facility like NCI is indispensable. Um, the other thing to remember is there's a real physical cost to storing data. It's not cheap. It's eye-wateringly expensive once you hit petascale. That's not obviously funded as a fundamental systematic strategy within this country. 
There are, of course, reviews going on at the moment around data strategy. Um, I'd encourage you to be up to date with what's coming from government on um, NR, what is it called? NDRI. NDRI, because it will affect most of you in the medium to long term. Last thing, good thing is generational change. Our students and our PhD students and our postdocs are so far ahead of us in how to handle data, it's, it's not funny. So I think this is going to get solved with a little bit of encouragement um, in the near term. Yeah, good, good point there. Maybe while you're up there, Leslie, and then we'll, I think, down here, and I've got two down here. So I'm um, just wanting to make some comments because we've just finished a project with ARDC, NCI, TURN, and... Um, um, who am I missing? Oscope. Sorry about that, Rebecca. And um, the amazing thing with that was we were looking at how we will use our data in 2030. And with the geophysical data sets, there's plenty of stuff around in data products, in highly processed data. But you try and get the original data as was collected in the field and you've got a challenge. And we were tracing down hard drives in uh, universities, PhD students. We were tracking down the people who collected the data to be able to do that. Because our whole world today, or not everywhere, I um, know the climate people have got their act together. But in many areas, the focus is on the delivery mechanism, the shiny object, the gridded data, the image that's easy to download and transfer. And yet the working data that we need, and Helen often argue the reason the minerals industry is not finding much in Australia is because it can't get access to the raw data. It can only get images and highly evolved products. And so I'm listening to all the fantastic stuff that you guys want to do on models and that in the future. Um, I can't tell you how much frustrating time we spent trying to get this data and bring it online. And that was the first problem. Because the second problem was most of the formats we used were developed in the 1980s. And they're really restricting our use of data. They're ASCII formats. I mean, sorry, I thought this was meant to be the science day and I hear I'm talking about data. But um, I think we really need to look closely and before you go and collect more data, that's definitely on the agenda. Look at what you've got now and ask, will I be able to use this on these fantastic systems, these fantastic integrative things that we want to do? Because I would argue for most of you, what's available today in dashboards and online GISs is not going to allow you to do it. Good on you, Leslie. Thanks for putting your hand up there. We'll... <laughs> uh, down the front, Rebecca, we've got two just here and it might just about, we'll get us pretty close to time, but we'll see. Oh, look at you, Dan. Gosh. Um, yeah, hello again. Um, yeah, so last week I attended the uh, the Access um, workshop, community workshop, and um, there were a couple of breakout sessions. Uh, one was on uh, CMIP7 and planning for, for the next, you know, um, you know model in into comparison projects in general, um, and the other was on paleo, paleo and, um, and, um, and cryo. And uh, so one of the things I'd missed hearing about was any sort of planning for uh, cryosphere model into comparison projects, if there are any. So does anybody know anything about that? That's a good question. You have to get the mic back. Good on you, Dan. I can comment on that one. Yes, we do have that kind of uh, model in intercompression project. ISMIP is one of them. And uh, there is another MIP called uh, MISMIP. It's another uh, marine acid ocean modeling comparison project. Uh, uh, mainly focused on the coupled ice ocean models. And that's based on the, the first stage of that MIP is first on the idealized setup. And the second stage of work will mainly focus on the urban sea sector. Yeah, so that's current MIPS, current so far from the Cryosphere. And the ISMIP project, the ISMIP 6, kind of contribute to the uh, IPCC report related with the sea level rise projections. And the ISMIP 7 is, um, is on the track and uh, will be based on the forcing files provided by the CMIP 7.
Ben, is that a direct response there? Yeah, and then we'll go. Yeah. So quick follow-up on that, on the MIPS side. Um, so have you got the infrastructure sorted out for the uh, data that you need on the input side and also your contributions on the output side? <laughs> Rebecca? <coughs> the <laughs> that thing in your hand. <laughs> the, the input... <laughs> The input data for the ISMIP6 project, uh, totally provided by the ISMIP6 uh, community, they just collect data from uh, CMIP5 and the CMIP6 uh, communities, and uh, with this kind of data has been validated. And uh, uh, in the first stage of the ISMIP6, 2100 projections, we did see the forcing provided by the access. And the output is that we kind of uh, share the data set to the ISMIP6 community using the uh, platform called Globus and that kind of use the, the database we, uh, we compile with the measurements to do the data um, assimilation to provide the silverized projections. Okay, excellent. No, Rebecca. Oh, okay. Uh, coming back to the question of constraints on data, in the agricultural space we've got a couple of binding constraints that haven't come up, so I thought I'd mention them. The first one is a federation constraint. So the sensor revolution has come to agriculture in the form of devices like yield monitors and walkover weighing devices, which means that individual landholders are now collecting heaps of potentially really useful data, and those data are utterly fragmented. And there have been two or three attempts to arrange for federation of them, and they've all run into the sand. The, so the data are there, but they're on so many more hard disks that Oscope would think they would have an easy job. Uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons why the federation efforts run into the sand is because those data are commercially sensitive. Right. Now, we're actually lucky in Australia that they're not being collected by the dead hand of John Deere as they are in the United States, but that's another story. The, there, is a, there are strong social constraints that lead to the difficulty of federation of the data. And in any populated landscape, there are going to be people with a stake who, should, who will have, in some sense, some kind of moral rights over the data, and if you don't get that right, then you don't get to use the data. And there was a wonderful example of that in a program called the Soil Carbon Research Program that was done in the 2010s. Uh, it was a multi-institutional program, and some of the institutions stuffed up getting the use rights declarations by the landholders, and it caused a great deal of difficulty subsequently. And since we're now trying to redo that exercise, so that we can see the landscape carbon trend, it's a bit of a thing. Um, so, my point here is, firstly, federation can be difficult in certain circumstances, and secondly, being aware of the social context in which you are trying to gather the data is absolutely vital. Mm, really interesting can of worms there, and carrots and sticks around. Where did that mic go? I can, I've got it, I've got it back, yeah. Um, we have similar issues in the mining industry. So um, the, and, and we, mining companies work through a, a licensing system to get access to the rocks underneath the, the surface. Um, but a lot of that, and they are mandated in every single state to submit their data um, to the government, to the various geoscience agencies that are state run. The way that we get around the commercial sensitivities is that there is a confidentiality period on that data. So government agencies can use the data for if there's important um, social aspects, um, if it's going to inform policy decisions because it's held by the government in confidence but it's not available to the public until a, you know, usually about five years. Um, and because rocks 
they do change, as we've established, but not that fast, then, then a five-year time period is enough for a company to make use of that data with, and, and, you know, uh, reach a commercial outcome without, um, you know, and, and then hand it over to the public. The social context then and, and the social impact of that data is then able to be um, taken into consideration, particularly when we work with traditional owners, because as we as we saw this morning, every inch of Australia is, is, is covered by um, or has a cultural significance to one or more groups. And so working with those and making that data available to those groups. So I think that there's, for the agricultural industry, um, there, there are perhaps some really great learnings from the mining industry, the mining industry being seen as a really big, bad, you know, body that that is actually very well regulated within Australia, maybe less so in overseas, but um, there, there is a lot of structure around how that data is made available and who can use it um, and how it's viewed and how it's then federated as well because the data, when it's submitted to the government, has to be in a particular form and meet certain standards. Yeah. It's constitutional with the minerals rights, isn't it? So there's quite so, a lot going on there. Sorry, can I just add, add one, one further point there? And that, that obviously all applies. But I think one of the other things that I'd like to see considered is the parallels in cases such as a lot of the landowner concerns around releasing their data from their farms um, with uh, the challenges that are being faced by biomedical researchers and anyone else who is doing research that fundamentally relates to people um, and to, to that moral right that you're talking about. And that within all of our data frameworks, I think we need to have systems that make it as easy as possible for us to deal with things like managing cohorts so that there can be the level of anonymization that groups feel comfortable with, uh, as well as addressing some of the, the other things that have just been mentioned. Thanks, Donald. I think we've just gone a little bit over time and we're probably actually just a little bit off topic because we've sort of forgotten a bit about the cryosphere, haven't we, Jen? So, um, but fantastic discussion and I wasn't going to stymie that and I think that primes us well for tomorrow. But um, as far as the cryosphere goes, I think we've, we've had some really good points raised. I think let it not be forgotten. There are many opportunities there. It is the engine room for so much of what we see happening on our planet. Um, I still stand by the comment I made about it. There's also a paleo, you know, a, a time frame thing there. And one thing that wasn't covered is also the, the drivers around research. Um, you know, we talked a bit about funding and, 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 and you know, just that, that kind of research curiosity, but there's also a really strong driver around, unfortunately perhaps, or fortunately, around sovereignty of Antarctica and, and how we... Um, are participants in that area through our research programs and, and making a difference to that <coughs> continent. So um, just something else to throw in there. So thank you, everybody. We're now going to move straight into another sphere. So thank you to the panel and the presenters and the discussion. Well done. <laughs> this, is our oh, this is our final sphere. I think Leslie said these are the guys that have got their act together. So it would be great to finish with that and hear all about it. Putting the, putting the pressure on you there, yeah, fantastic. So onto the atmosphere. And to kick us off, we've got Lisa from University of New South Wales. Thanks, Lisa. Good on you. Just make sure you... Okay, just check this works. Click. Need to arrow it. Okay, cool. Right. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks very much for the, to the organizers for inviting me. And one of the, the best things about being the last sphere is that basically everyone's covered all of the points that I'm probably gonna make in this uh, talk. So I probably don't need to say anything. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I'm gonna focus on a sort of a very high level global observations perspective. Um, and Emma, who's talking after me, is going to focus down on sort of a regional modelling perspective. So hopefully between us, we'll try and cover uh, much of the issues that uh, we have. So I framed my talk around the challenges that I think 
there will be in combining um, atmospheric observations into what I've called an integrated Earth system data model. Notice not a digital twin. I haven't called it that. But. Um, so um, Dahlia gave a very much more exciting slide than this, but essentially the point is the same. Um, we have enormous amounts of weather and climate information that are used every day to give us more and more accurate weather forecasts, and that's from satellites, um, from um, in situ based uh, stations, from radar. Um, we have lots and lots of sources of this information. But of course, um, we don't observe everything everywhere, and, and there are gaps. Um, so this is a big data challenge, and something's gone wrong with this slide, but um, essentially there's supposed to be two circles that are kind of overlapping here. Um, so this is a big data challenge, and people have talked about this already, the computational needs that uh, we need for this, the data storage needs, expensive, as Andy mentioned, the analysis needs, and obviously the data requirements um, change with the scale of our purpose, and that's kind of the space and time scales that we're talking about here. And, and what I mean by that is if I'm making a weather forecast or I want to do a climate change study, then the amount of data, the quality of that data, and the duration of that data, and the space scales of that data are actually a little bit different. So there are also challenges of acquiring all of this data globally, as, as we've heard. Um, and for example, if I work for a National Weather Service, then I can acquire lots of this data that I've shown you on the previous slide through the global telecommunication system. But if I'm a researcher, for example, then it's going to be very hard for me to access easily a lot of this information. So let's take this research framing uh, perspective um, and let's ask the research question, how much will it rain in the future? So uh, we've shown that rainfall or precipitation is, is sort of a good integrator across um, lots of spheres. Um, and one reason is, well, you might say, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but through the World Climate Research Program over several decades um, and through their um, coupled model in a comparison project, which uh, people have also already mentioned, um, we do have the ability through um, strict protocols um, in terms of the simulations that are made, um, in terms of the projections and scenarios that are made, and in terms of the data output and the metadata and all of the file naming conventions, we do have a protocol for making these global simulations and looking at, for example, um, what are the changes in daily rainfall intensity per degree of global warming? And we can do that for all of these global models that we have. The amounts of data are, are so large that there isn't one place that we can store all of this data. But for example, NCI do have quite a lot of this information stored. Um, so let's look. Well, broadly speaking, if we look, now there are now over 100 uh, models, global models, from over 50, about 50 modeling centers around the world. Um, and we can take all of these models and we can look at uh, projections for rainfall. And broadly speaking, if we look at a global perspective, then our rainfall intensity follows our theoretical expectations of what should happen when we um, increase our global temperatures. Now, but when you look at this a bit more um, uh, closely in detail, the regional responses vary. And if I take one model uh, on the left-hand side, the CESM model, and I take the other model uh, from CSIRO, uh, Mark 3.6, you can see that for Australia, we're either going to see a sort of 3 to 6% increase uh, in rainfall intensity or about a 3 to 6% decrease in rainfall intensity. So which one of these models is correct? Well, a sort of necessary but insufficient condition would be, well, if a model can simulate um, the historical climate well, then perhaps we would you know, have some more confidence in that climate are in that climate model. So um, this is where observations become vital. But unfortunately, in terms of the atmosphere, um, we're really talking um, about, uh, while we have this great protocol for CMIP, uh, we actually don't have such a good protocol for our observational data sets. So um, 
a few years ago, um, led by a group in France, they developed this uh, frogs database where they took all of the global uh, rainfall observational data sets and they combined them in a database on the same uh, grid and same time step so that they could be intercompared. Um, and that's left us with actually 22 data sets. So we actually have also enormous amounts of observational data sets. So we would expect that all of these rainfall data sets should say the same thing because they're observations, right? Okay, so a simpler research question then would be how much has it rained in the past? And well, the answer to that is, well, pick a number somewhere between 800 millimeters and you know, 1200 millimeters over land. Um, and this is from all of these different uh, data sets that we have. And in fact, the spread here in our observational data sets is about as large as it is across our global climate models. Now, while we can't answer the research question, it has been an integration success story because we've been able to bring all of these data sets together in the same format and then try and understand where some of these differences are coming in. So that's, that's research. So of course, though, this is an integration across the atmosphere and not only the atmosphere, but across one variable from the atmosphere. It's not across spheres and it's not across multiple variables. But I just wanted to point out that when we do integrate these data sets, we have much, uh, we can uh, have a lot more insights in terms of our research and try and answer some fundamental uh, research questions. So an even simpler research question would be, well, we've got lots of data uh, across Australia, we've got um, you know, 20,000 rain gauges, um, and we've got lots of satellite measurements. Um, so maybe we can actually do a lot better over Australia than we can. Well, the success story again is we have quite a large range of uncertainty across Australia. Um, I've highlighted here, if I can get it, um, the um, Australian uh, gridded uh, climate data set for the, from the Bureau. So this would be our sort of benchmark here. Um, and that's, that's the little, whoops, mark in blue over there. So it basically sits slap bang in the middle, basically, of all of our um, data sets. And this is where we've actually removed the data sparse regions from this. So we're not, we're not even trying to include regions where uh, we don't have a lot of data. So this is only in regions where we actually do have large amounts of information. So um, this has already come up um, previously in other talks. I mean, there are these integrated databases and tools now that are coming online. And here's an example from the Copernicus Climate Data Store. And here you can go in and you can access your observed or your model data from the atmosphere or the land, so the biosphere, the cryosphere, or the hydrosphere. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, right, I might understand which atmospheric data set to use, but I have no idea um, of any of the other types of data sets which would be the best one to use for this purpose. And how would I pick those data sets? And I think someone said uh, earlier, you know, you just basically contact someone that you know or you ask them to contact someone they know. So that's kind of how it's been, been done. So there are lots and lots of challenges for integration. I, I don't think anybody uh, questions that. Um, so even the effort to, require, uh, to integrate the data within one sphere, and CMIP is a good example, that's been going on over decades. Now. Um, so we're now at the point, but now the amounts of data that are being produced are so large that even that is becoming um, in, you know, an enormous um, challenge. Computational requirements, the storage needs, the costs of those, the common data formats that we're going to need, the models, the common models and tools. Um, somebody was mentioning, you know, the conversion from ASCII data to NetCDF or from NetCDF to shapefiles if I want to do a GIS layers. Um, how are we going to access all of these, these data and availability? And I know um, that previously QA, QC has been mentioned a lot. And obviously that's something um, that we, is a challenge and that we really need to think about. Um, how to incorporate indigenous knowledge and oral histories and documentary evidence. And Jim, um, in his talk, talked about this. And I think maybe my framing is wrong here because maybe we should be thinking about how to incorporate the, the sort of uh, 
data spheres into the ind indigenous knowledge framework. So maybe it's the other way around. Um, I'm wondering who the users of this data are because I think once we integrate these data, um, you know, if it's for researchers or policymakers or for sector use, then then it's going to be a different thing that we're we're thinking about or producing. What's fit for purpose? That's something. That's a term that's been mentioned several times today. Whose job is it to do this integration, and who's going to fund it long term? Um, for example, what do we do with commercially valuable data? Um, that's been talked about. Um, somebody talked about um, public private partnerships and we talked about the sensitivity of commercial uh, commercial data but you know that these data might be valuable and you know if we don't sell them how do we fund something like this long term because the problem being is you know we can develop this integrated framework but we need to keep it going um, otherwise it's going to become obsolete very quickly and how do we prioritize all these things since since we can't do everything um, and as I've been sitting listening to this, uh, these talks, which have been really excellent, um, you know, there's other things like the inconsistencies in how we use terminology. That's that's come up several times. What is a model? I mean, how how are we going to um, uh, sort of meet all these challenges? So moving forward, um, I think really um, I'm. There's a few things um, I think um, that we should should look to on top of everything that everybody else has already said. And I, I don't think I'm probably saying anything new here, but improvements um, in our databases, in our cataloging, how do we find these data sets even? Uh, the guidance documents, like how do we know which data sets to use? So we don't just want sort of a one-stop shop, but we, we want to include guidance on, on what data sets we need to use and for which purpose. Um, and on, whoops, on this side here, um, thank you. Oh. oh yeah. So on this side, this is sort of a decision tree for selecting a data set to use. If I, for example, wanted to look at long-term changes in temperature and precipitation extremes in a region. And it basically goes through from, you know, if you have, you know, if you have data from your MET service you, and it's highly qual quality controlled, use that, through to, you know, use a satellite product or use reanalysis data. So moving forward, you know, we're going to see improvements in our modeling. Um, and I'm not going to talk so much about this because Emma's going to focus on this later. But we've talked about uh, data assimilation has been mentioned. Um, but just to say there are ways to, you know, take our global climate model output at sort of relatively coarse resolution and downscale that to the spatial resolution that might be uh, relevant for climate studies. Or, um, you know, now we're getting to the sort of convection permitting scales of, um, of regional models. Um, and here, you know, we might have 200 or, or 400 meters. But when we get down to these scales, I mean, then we have the problems of how to represent things at smaller scale. And here I'm just showing, uh, you know, the ur uh, an urban representation. And, you know, how do we, how do we include cities um, as we move forward? So the requirements are becoming more and more complex. We also need some systematic way to evaluate our models. Um, and for example, you know, if we had a suite of uh, model output here, could we test it against some minimum standards? So we, we can have some minimum standards that we say, well, the model doesn't meet these minimum standards that we've set, so those models pass or they fail. Um, and then we can make it more and more complicated depending on uh, what the use cases or who the end user is and what they're using. So we need some way to systematically evaluate the models, but we've seen that there's also this observational uncertainty, so we need to include that as well. I think machine learning is something um, that's being talked about also today, and this is, I think, a really good case for integration. Uh, for example, when we're using our predictor variables, you know, we might, you know, use atmospheric variables, but we might want to include land surface states, for example, and that then could help um, improve um, how we, you know, go from a global climate model through to something that can be used um, at a, a sort of very local fine scale. Um, and obviously, this has been talked about quite a bit as well, is using 
these fair and care principles. So, you know, we need some kind of integrated common data model that's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, but I think we also need to acknowledge that that's also not sufficient and there are other um, types of data and information that we need to include, such as indigenous um, knowledge, which would really help the value of this um, integration. Um, I think this is my last slide. Um, so the there is great value in integration, and I think it's necessary that we do it um, to get to have valuable insights into you know a, a comprehensive view of the Earth system, and also to give that improved data delivery uh, for stakeholders. Now we already have multiple um, different um, initiatives that are already exist, like uh, Digital Earth Australia, like the Australian Climate Service is kicking off the National Partnerships for Climate Projections. Um, I see the directors of um, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes and Weather of the 21st Century here. So lots and lots of things can come together. And what we don't want is to add another layer on top of this. We need to try and combine all of the information that we already have and try and strategically make um, sort of the best decisions uh, for moving forward. So thank you. Excellent. Well done, Lisa. That was fantastic. Jaden's just adding a little bit of power to the getting late in the day. Needs a bit of an extra charge. That's fair enough. We're now going to move over to the ECR presentation. We've got Emma Howard to give us that. Emma's from the Bureau of Meteorology. And I think I, my introduction has just covered Jaden doing the recharge. Well done. Thanks, Emma. Take it away. Thank you. So, and um, thanks for um, the introduction, and thanks, um, Lisa, for um, your very comprehensive overview of the challenges and priorities in data in our field. Now, as Lisa said, I'm going to narrow the focus a little bit and talk about one component of atmospheric science, and that is high resolution regional modeling, or as we like to call it, convection permitting modeling. Um, so, oh no, oh, my lovely animation is gone. Um, that's very sad. Um, okay, uh, so, Convection permitting atmospheric modeling is um, mo or models, uh, models with resolutions of typically around one to four kilometers. And I'm going to try and convince you with this slide, made difficult by the animation, um, why these uh, models are exciting and important. So, as Andy helpfully said before, in the atmospheric space and in some of these other spheres, we have this advantage that we know the equations of motion. And that means if we can reach high enough resolution to resolve the largest scales of motion, we are actually um, solving partial dif differential equations and filling the gaps with um, parameterization schemes. Now, our, um, our equations are nonlinear, and that means that every length scale is important. We can only resolve the largest, or there, there is a limit to what we can resolve. Um, and in most climate models um, that we know about, we resolve the horizontal length scales really well. What's exciting about this one to four kilometers it means we start to resolve the vertical motion in storms, which is really w means we, on a first order level, we're closing that circulation. Um, so that's sort of a scientific reason why it's exciting. Um, and what that means, and what you would have been able to see in this animation, is that we get um, better spatial representations of rainfall and clouds. Um, and so we get, typically in the um, parameterized models, we see that rainfall is um, too frequent and too, um, like too frequent at low, uh, low intensities and too infrequent at high intensities. 
Um, whereas at convection permitting resolution, we really start to see storms that look a bit more realistic. Um, so we've been using these sorts of models in the Bureau in forecasting out to seven, or 20, from seven, 2017. Um, but in climate, it's, a lot, it's taking a bit longer to take on. Um, in the Australian Climate Service, we're interested in these models because of their improved representation of, ha of um, intense weather, such as um, rainfall, flash flooding, tropical cyclones. We also, just by increasing that resolution, get better representation of things like mountains and the land surface. Um, and that's sort of where we're most interested here, is this, um, well, where I think we, we can talk, with, we get really interesting um, priorities with integration, because in order to, because we're getting that extra heterogeneity from these, um, this higher resolution, we need to start resolving more processes that occur at these higher resolutions um, in these models for, to make our models work right and to be resolving the processes that we're talking about um, today. Um, so now on this slide, I wanna take a step back and talk about what sort of atmospheric models typically get run this sort of time in history. So the ones that have been more brought up most commonly today is the global climate projections. So that's the CMIP-6, IPCC, sort of 50 to, a, to 200 times uh, kilometer grid scaling and time scales of hundreds of years. Then we have our weather forecast models. Um, so that's what well, in the Australian version of that is called Access Global. It has 12 kilometer grid spacing and rains, runs for about seven days. Um, the global forecast models, um, now this is where we start to get into the convective and permitting work. Um, so this is um, the first few days and these are, we have currently used city models just over each capital city. Um, but currently in development is a domain over the whole of Australia. And also there's some really great work in that very early couple of days just over the urban um, areas, again under development up to sort of 300 metres. And then the convection, uh, the convective scale climate and regional scale climate, the sort of standard is what we call Cordex and that's been run over lots of regions in the world, um, including Cordex Australasia. And that's what the Australian Climate Pro Service is project producing as our core projections and what the National Partnership for Climate Projections is working on a lot. That's sort of timescales of 50 to 100 years. And then the exciting stuff is taking that to the convection permitting resolution. Now, um, there's some things that don't fit in these boxes, which is uh, seasonal forecasts, global coupled climate, and um, emerging work, which is doing convective scale at the global scale. Now, while I've got this slide up, I thought I'd have a quick talk about, because it's come up a lot, the data assimilation work. So data assimilation is primarily happening down in the forecast space. I wonder if I can get a pointer up. So that's in here and in here. And so that's taking the work that, um, or the, the observations that Lisa was talking about so observations of things like global precipitation, precipitable water from satellites, um, these things called atmospheric motion vectors, which give some sense of the winds. Um, there's irra uh, radiances from sat uh, satellite um, cloud observations. Um, and then there's also local things like think what, what's coming out of um, like all aeroplanes take measurements of the atmospheric state, there's the weather balloons, there's the surface observation, and that's sort of a, um, that's all the upper atmosphere, and then on the surface, there's things like satellite-based soil moisture and satellite, or, and um, the automatic weather station data as well, so temperature and humidity. Um, and that's, the, there's other thing, oh no, I'll move on to the next slide now. Um, to get, because I've got a bit more detail on that. Um, 
here. So now this is my view of how we integrate or push in data from and theory and from the different um, spheres in this work. So um, the hydrosphere, so, so these different models, so I've split global into um, climate models and earth system models. Earth system models um, have a lot more processes that, um, so they, they, they will include the climate model processes. So climate models are generally coupled to the earth system. All models uh, have some sort of soil moisture coupling and these weather models are assimilating, as I said, the um, information about the soil wetness um, and the station observations. Uh, biosphere, so we all have various degrees of vegetation models. Um, we have vegetation tiling, canopy models. Um, in climate, the earth system models have dynamical vegetation. The, um, the, the models that, the, the regional models typically just have fixed vegetation and fixed leaf area index. Um, and the weather models um, have that fixed as well at the moment. There's talk at the Bureau or some new work on trying to, um, trying to assimilate leaf area index data, but we need to improve our soil our vegetation models in order to do that. Um, the snow in the sea, oh, so the, we've got snow models, of course, um, which, um, as we said before, needs some improvement. Um, and then our orographic features coming from the, um, just the, the, so the, the bottom boundary condition. And then in the CPM space, we're really interested in improving the ocean coupling, um, the surface hydrology and vegetation. And some groups around the world are looking at improved snow schemes. Um, so move quickly through some of this. So as we increase our resolution to this conglomerate scale, we find that we need to improve um, the land surface processes. So an example from the US, they found that when they included a groundwater model, um, they could cut their biases by half in this particular case where groundwater was really important for moisture recycling in the region and without it, their temperatures were just getting too hot and they weren't getting enough rainfall. Um, so some plans, improvements to uh, the land, to the hydrological model at the Bureau include adding in river routing, interactive vegetation, um, and more broadly around the Met Office are interested in groundwater and lateral flow. Ocean coupling is a big one, so um, getting these convective scale models to couple to the um, ocean, we believe will improve some um, atmos or some biases in rainfall. Um, so this is just an example of that, um, of an atmosphere only convective committing model has far too wet biases over the ocean. And this one had dry biases that were resolved with a very simple ocean mixed layer coupling. Um, I'm interested to know if our climate um, model output data is um, useful to the biosphere. Um, so I've got a plot here of um, the sort of temp uh, orographic representation we end up with when um, we're going to this four kilometer scale over the ACT. And you can see that with, at the other length scales, we're really not getting any of these sorts of mountains. Um, and we are when we get to the convective scale, which I think should be really important for ecosystems. Um, but really interested at this meeting to talk about whether that's important indeed. Um, and just I'll leave here with some information about the output that we're creating at uh, the Bureau at the moment. So we have regional reanalyses, and these use data assimilation over a climate time scale. Um, by restarting every sort of six hours or so. Um, we have the Cordex Australasia that we're working on at the moment. Um, there's some exciting work coming out um, in research experiments, Oz2200 and weather in the 21st century. And we're getting into these climate, convection permitting climate reanalysis and projections as well.
Well done, Emma. You, gee, you covered a lot in there. And I suspect you probably could have gone for a bit longer with it too because there's a lot of content. So well done. Good on you. Okay, panel. This is the last one for today. Let's make it really, really go. And we're going to start off with you, Charmaine. So firstly, thanks to Lisa and Emma for their really fantastic um, pre presentations. The one thing that I did just want to um, pick up on is, um, I think with closer integration and developing a true Earth system uh, model, one of the really exciting things is not only may we improve our, the reliability of our predictions, both for weather and climate um, forecasting, but we may also be able to push beyond our current limits of predictability. So currently for weather forecasting, we do a pretty good job at um, giving you weather forecasts for the next couple of days. And we also simulate quite accurately the global weather patterns for out for about two weeks. But then our predictability drops off and we don't do a very good job. Um, but then at the seasonal timescales and climate timescales, where we couple the models to the ocean, we pick up the memory, the longer memory in the land surface and the oceans, and then we can produce more reliable um, predictions. But we are kind of sitting in this space where we, we can't, at the moment, do a very good job at the uh, multi-week or sub-seasonal um, forecasting. But potentially, if we have closer coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean and sea ice and the land surface. And we also push those models to higher resolution so they're more accurately representing some really critical um, physical processes. We may start be able to doing a better job in terms of predictability at these sort of sub-seasonal timescales. And there's a really big demand out there for um, information on those, those timescales, both from the public but also from industry um, as well. So I think there's some really interesting and, and exciting science opportunities there for closer integration and developing sort of these really fantastic Earth system uh, models. Yeah, terrific. And a really important part of that Earth system, you know, the engine room for the Earth system too. So great. So I'm hoping we'll get plenty of comments here. Rebecca, you're going to have to go back of the room. It's the last one. Come on, be kind. Tim, good help's hard to find these days, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, Nicholas Deutscher, University of Wollongong. Um, I'm an atmospheric chemist, measurement scientist, maybe. Um, and I just wanted to, to touch on that point that in terms of the... You know, we haven't heard much mentioned about atmospheric chemistry or, or measurements of gas phase composition apart from what's interesting for, for weather and climate. Um, of course, it all is interesting for climate. Um, but to just touch on that point, I think we're seeing a push at the moment um, with the satellites that are coming out that can measure greenhouse gas composition, for example, that are getting increasingly impressive in what they can do on increasingly finer resolution. Um, and I think that point of, of the improved resolution in the models for representing um, gas composition, atmospheric composition, is also vitally important um, because we're going to be wanting to push to, to better resolve uh, and better quantify um, what's going on and what's you know, the interactions between, particularly between the biosphere and, and, and um, the atmosphere, but also, also the oceans. Um, yeah, so I'd just echo that point and wave the flag for atmospheric composition measurements as well. Yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that side of it. Any comments from the panel? Great to see the chemistry side as well as physics being covered. Yeah, yeah um, so atmospheric composition is really important, but it's also in terms of when we run our forecast models, it's also really expensive, computationally expensive. Um, so I, I think when we're developing our Earth system models, we do need to develop them in such a way that you can add in the additional complexity when it's required, but also you can run um, simulations um, without that or with a, a cut down simplified version potentially um, as well. Yeah, it's also becoming more and more mainstream in earth sciences too, looking at the um, you know, atmospheric degassing of the earth in, in some areas for, as a pathfinder for certain mm -hmm. systems that, that people might be looking at. Hugh. Yes, um, great talks and conversation, the word model which somebody tried to define up here in about three ways, and I could think of another seven ways to define it, but very confusing. You know, my daughter, granddaughter has a model, rhinoceros. Is that a model? 
what is a model? Um, but I notice in this part of the world, atmospheric talk, um, two talks we talked about forecasts, and then somebody said a forecast model, a model forecast. <laughs> so what is a forecast if it isn't a model? Because I'm getting ecologists telling me they're making forecasts, and then they say, oh, that's, a, that's an actual prediction of the future with no error bars at all. Wow, that's good. I'd like those sorts of forecasts. So what is a forecast and what is a model? Sorry. Because we can confuse, we, I'm confused, but I'm sure the general public's confused. I think people think forecasts are more accurate, but does that just mean that I should change all my models to forecasts? I think, Charmaine, I saw the microphone move there. Is that, no, that was, yeah, okay. That's fine. But does someone Our forecasts to... are very accurate. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think a forecast would have to have error in it, though, wouldn't it? I... It's the output of a model, if that makes sense. So we have to define the initial state, um, and that's where the observations come in, and that's where data assimilation comes in for us. Um, but data assimilation, we only have discrete points, if you like, and so um, we have to have a model to fill in um, the, the rest of the, the space to initialize um, our forecast model, and then we drive it forward in time. Okay, excellent. There's also supermodels, but that's a whole other thing, <laughs> another topic altogether. So, anything else out there? Ben likes that one. <laughs> um, so, I've got a question for the panel and probably the room in general. We've heard a lot today about the importance of metadata and describing the data well. Um, and Donald, you even mentioned nationally recommended models and data um, that would, you know, would be really useful. Um, I have a question. Is it feasible to expect people to use data and models from different spheres without expert support? So, Lisa, you mentioned um, providing guidance on which data sets to use and for which purpose, which I think is fantastic. Is that enough? I, I've come from the biosphere. I can't even imagine a trying to use atmospheric or cryosphere data. Um, I don't think I have the knowledge to do that. So what, do we, what else do we need besides having well-described data, which is an absolute necess necessity? Great question. Donald? Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm very naive on this, and I'm probably going to get the terminology all wrong. But as far as I'm concerned... Uh, and, and this is purely in my own head, a model is anything that gives me a value for a variable that interests me. And it may be cleaning data and giving the best estimate of what the actual values were. It may be trying to fill in a gap and predict what the very real value would have been somewhere. It may be forecasting something in the future or the deep past or something like that. But either way, it's an attempt to get a to get at one variable or a set of covariables that we're interested in using as either, either as the answer to some question or as an input into something else. And so my, my perspective on this is that we desperate, and I've said this already, but that we desperately need to be thinking about the synthesis activities between our domains so that we can be looking at the processes that connect us and starting to agree between the different spheres on some of the variables, the essential variables, that are going to be most useful for those in the other spheres to carry on their work and produce their own models and estimates. Uh, and, and therefore, I think, I think the, the, the idea of good models really makes most sense in the context of essential variables and the two are really flip sides of each other. I want to expand on that as well. And we talk, we've, we've been talking all day about how we might integrate very, very different types of data. But if, if a research question or a, or a piece of work requires um, the use of data from another sphere, 
data from another mother. <laughs> that was what was going to come out. I had to force myself to say sphere. Um, then, then perhaps we should not only be integrating our data but also integrating ourselves and collaborating better so that when we use that data, we've got peers with us who who are experts in that field and who can say, yes, this is the one that you should use. And and absolutely, you know, one, one of the, the students before was saying, well, I, I ask a person that I know who might ask another person. And, and that's totally valid because that's why we have networks, you know, and that's why we do develop collaborations so that we have somebody that we can go to to ask those questions of. Whoa, I saw three hands go up at once. <laughs> there may have even been four. Um, Rebecca, you... you Sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I want to discuss this notion of the best data set. And Lisa gave us a lovely example. There's a database of how many was it, Lisa? 20? 22 different estimates of rainfall. And I, I think the community has to go beyond saying this is the best and we ignore the other 21. That's just silly because we just... Three hours ago, we talked about uncertainty and how all data is uncertain, how all observations are uncertain. So these are all estimates of rainfall. The most important thing is that we understand why they're different and uh, which one might, which five or 12 or all 22 we might want to apply to our problem. And I think this just speaks to also not overestimating the value of an one individual data set over others, which is really important for our work. And in modeling, climate modeling, we do it all the time because of, we want to span some of the uncertainty. And to me, yeah, I just, I just want to bring this up. This is three hours ago, we talked about uncertainty. Now we're talking about finding the best data set for our problem. That thing does not exist. There's no such thing. There's a number of different data sets that may work. And we have to understand why they're different. And once you know that, you've learned something. So across the aisle, just there, yeah, and then down the front. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Sumner from the Antarctic Division. <coughs> I just wanted to pick up on that comment above about um, needing expert help because I think that's true even in the same corridor <laughs> where you work. <laughs> and it, it doesn't really matter how far or wide or narrow you look, it's every data set and formats are really important. The way they're gridded, everything is really important. Um, the example I wanted to say was, like if you look at a gridded data set, like temperature of the ocean, it's pretty simple to take that, those temperature values and move them around into other, into other forms. But as soon as it's a, a vector data set, like a wind current or surface currents, it's a very different proposition. And I don't think even examples have well worked out out there in our culture. Um, and I just want to add to that, the really best thing is code examples, so actual documentation, but live documentation that's code that runs today. It's got to be able to be run, you know? And there's, there's nothing better for illustrating how stuff works or for learning yourself than, than code that, that you can actually see and run. And, and I'll just say the exemplar is really the open Data Cube, they have an incredible notebooks that are maintained on a daily basis to keep them running, and I don't think we can beat that. There's even um, so many things in these notebooks that we found used quite a lot that we actually factored them out of the notebooks and put them in their own dedicated library. So, you know, there's even more to grow from there. Can you get down the front? And, and of course, when you say we, we're talking about Geoscience Australia and, and Digital Earth Australia. And, yeah, Timothy. Um, I can give an example of um, something that, that crosses um, sphere boundaries that I, that I know of, um, you know, in the, uh, in the uh, atmosphere, and that is, um, you know, when a forecast model is uh, suddenly hit with the data assimilation challenge of a volcano going off, um, and um, you know, can can anybody talk about um, you know that sort of uh, you know thing where you're you're following along with a model, but suddenly it has to assimilate data that exists because you, your model doesn't take into account something utterly different, like for example a volcano within an atmospheric model. So I mean, depending on what parameters you're talking about, they wouldn't be assimilated. 
So, I mean, if we're not running with atmospheric chemistry and aerosols, um, then, and, and it's a really interesting um, example, actually, for the fires um, that someone spoke about before. And so when we had the Black Summer um, fires, the atmospheric model was actually underestimating, or sorry, was overestimating our surface temperatures because it didn't take smoke into consideration. There was a lot of smoke in the atmosphere that was sheltering the surface from the solar radiation. Um, so it's a really good example about why we need to integrate um, our models. And currently we do run a lot of the atmospheric model will force um, air quality and dispersion and volcanic ash uh, models, but they're separate, they're offline, so they're not integrated. Um, so in terms of data assimilation at this, this point in time, until we have those um, systems integrated, then they, they wouldn't be taken into consideration. So the specific um, case I was thinking about was the, uh, the uh, volcano in... Um, uh, in Tahiti, which I think um, it did um, throw a lot of water vapour into the atmosphere. So that would have been picked up by some satellites and so that, that probably would have been assimilated into the model. Um, but if you have a really large um, difference between your observations and your model, um, then actually we, we say that the uncertainty in the observations is so large that we can't use that observation. Leslie, I saw a hand up there. Um, Slightly changing the topic, and unfortunately still sticking to data, not science. Um, data is supposed to be science if you do the program, but anyway. Um, we've talked a bit about FAIR. And a lot of people don't realise that a lot of data that is described as FAIR is not FAIR. And, and the authors of the paper who wrote, that, wrote a retraction where they said 90% of it's not FAIR for the simple reason that the vocabularies that are used to describe the data are not fair themselves. That is available online to be shareable with full definitions. And we're slowly trying to address this, but it's a mountain of effort. But I'd also like to highlight one, and I may get myself into trouble here, and that is, we're all talking about models, and I'm wondering whether our language is the same across all spheres, and whether there is a definition of the parameters and minimum variables that define a model. And the reason I ask this is that I'm helping a group in Oscope develop a model atlas for you know 3D geodynamic models, and they said they couldn't find a vocabulary and I was in Germany in Europe last week and I asked a couple of groups there who are doing models and they said, uh-uh, if you find one, let us know. So I'm just kind of wondering, getting down to tin tacks, which I have a terrible habit of doing, is um, we want to work across the spheres. You can see the scale of the computation that most of you are working at or are going to work at. This is not going to be human readable, human, interactable, it's got to be machine to machine. So where are we at with developing these vocabularies, in particular the ones that help describe and define our models? Give you a pin drop. Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> I was expecting hands. Okay. Well, look, we... We're pretty close to time, so I might actually call it because we've got a couple of things that we want to do. So, um, firstly, thanks to the speakers in um, both the spheres today, the cryosphere, but, but particularly the, um, the atmosphere there. I only say that because I think we thanked the cryosphere before. I can't remember now. It's a blur. So, um, but no, thanks. Thanks to the speakers. Thanks to the panel. And thanks to everyone for being involved. Um, just, oh, yeah. Let's do it. Um, and for those the speakers, um, come and see me. We've got a thank you for you. Um, and the panellists too. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Um, but we've got a couple of things. One of them, here's a little bit of housekeeping. Rebecca, you've done a great job on moving the microphone around. I think I return the favour and make sure we promote this again. Yep, terrific. Um, so you talked about that earlier today, so I won't repeat it, but just remind Oh, look, you've got a microphone. When it works? Yeah, so I can talk now. Um, yeah, so please have a look at that. Um, we don't mean it to be an arduous task, but if we can just get some input while we're all here, we know that once 
we leave at 5.30 tomorrow, the chances of us being able to engage kind of drop off. Happy to do that. Yeah, we, we got together. Maybe we ended it up down a wormhole. That's fine. Yep. That's, that sounds great. Yep. Okay, I've got... Oh, no, Rebecca... You... Yeah, can I just respond to that, though? Like, if you don't get what we want, I mean, we're all... Just write down some capabilities that we have or that you would like and, you know, try a new sheet and just add in some information about the data capabilities. So there's that first tab that kind of explains what we're after. As I'm more than happy for people to go freestyle. I know right. it's risky. Right. -o. Okay, that's great. Can we. I Those tabs are based on the NCRIS capabilities, so there isn't a specific cryosphere. So if you want to put that in the access NRI, that would be perfectly fine. Or you can create your own tab if you would prefer. Like, I'm, I'm honestly really happy if people don't get what we're asking for in those individual tabs. Just create your own, name it, whatever you want, and just start bashing out some capabilities to do with data infrastructures that we have or that we need. Excellent. Okay, um, two other things. One is to say that we do have a close of day event out in the back room. And I have been told that there are some fantastic... Um, inspirations or, or um, additions to what is on offer out there from um, Bush Tucker. So we'll, that'll be interesting to see what is included there. I don't know the details too much, other than to say that's something to look for and could be exciting. Um, so that's out in the back room where we've, we've had our earlier breaks. Um, just a, Tim? Oh, okay, no worries. It's all good. Um, just a little bit on today. Um, you know, we, we've, we've said lots of thanks to the speakers and, and um, the panellists and, and everyone's participation. Um, just, a, just a sort of broad comment from me. I, look, I think it's been a fabulous day. I've actually wasn't sure what to expect at the start of the day. I had all sorts of fear about, you know, how are we going to fill the time and coaxing out responses from people and um, or is someone going to sort of sort of go off their, off their nana, so to speak, and, 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 and how am I going to moderate them? And I uh, didn't need to do that, so that's, that's great. I think one comment that's been made a few times, and I, th and I think it's, it's valid, but it's fine, is there's been a lot of talk about data rather than the science. I think Leslie said it a few times and a few others have commented too. Um, I, the way I see it is that the actual science presentations have actually inspired those discussion points. I think when we've seen presentations of models and, and, and things like that, that um, that's been something that's then been really taken up by the audience. And I, th I feel that that ideally primes us really well for tomorrow's discussion, where we do have a lot more focus on bringing it together and data and, and there's some breakout groups and things like that in the schedule. So um, I think, well, I feel today was, I, I really enjoyed it and I could sense from everyone's body language and engagement that 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 was actually near to universal, if not universal. So, well done, thank you. One last thing for me to add up there, and that is that we do want to do a group photo I mentioned earlier, and I think we've got the people upstairs are sort of getting into position. Yep, thumbs up. Um, but Tim, did you have any wrap ups? You Thanks, like Steve. Yeah, so. Just before we do the group photo, um, I just wanted to thank you, Steve, for holding the fort on stage all day. It was a big ask of you, and it was a big ask of the panel members as well. So I'd like to thank the panel members again. We didn't know how this was going to run because it was a different type of meeting and a different type of conversation. And I, I didn't realise at the start of the day how much I'd asked of the six of you. So thank you to all of you, because I think you've really provided such fabulous input into the conversation. Anna, thank you.